PowerPoint and uh, slideshow from the beginning. All right. So what we've got here is uh, we're talking about analog to digital and digital to analog conversions. Uh, as you guys know, like most um, real life values are analog. So if we're talking things like the level of a tank, or if we're talking things like, um, you know, process temperatures, all that kind of stuff, a lot of times it go, it's analog. Well, it, it, all of it's analog. And it goes into a transmitter, and the transmitter it could be digital or it could be analog. And then there's, there's conversions that have to do uh, an analog to digital conversion. And then if I'm looking at something that's going to like a final control element, that also uh, could be digital or it could be analog. Uh, for example, if, if it's going to a final control element that is a uh, valve uh, with an actuator, uh, we use pressure and we use pressure to go to these, uh, to open and close these valves and that's all analog. Um, then you look at, like if you have a positioner on it and stuff like that, uh, the positioner would be digital. So you can see where uh, the analog and digital are very important to us as instrument techs. And that's why we talk about this analog to digital and digital to analog conversion. So the ILM I've got is 310301C. So the objectives here are going to be describe the purpose and applications of both ADCs and DACs. So ADC being analog to digital uh, converter or controller and then the DAC, digital to analog converter. Describe the re resolution and calculate the resolution based on the number of bits of binary data. Um, there's nothing about binary really in this uh, ILM. So what I'm doing is I'm going to give you a quick rundown again of that uh, when we get to it. It's just a rundown of what binary is again. And, and I'll just, I'll explain it, but it's not in your ILM. So it's just an explanation for you guys to remember that you did this in second year. Describe a multiplexer application. These multiplexers take uh, input, several inputs, and they um, uh, basically what they do is they'll take uh, inputs from the field and they'll deal with them depending on what the multiplexer uh, deems important. And that's from you guys that are going to be programming these multiplexers. So we, we talk about that also. And the last thing, explain terms and specifications for both ADCs and DACs. And that's like cards and things like that. When we talk about input cards and output cards and uh, dig, uh, analog to digital and digital analog, we, we, we I just I've got some things that are like um, your analog cards and your digital cards, stuff like that. And they have on those, they have actual uh, specifications that we'll, we'll talk a little bit about. All right, some terms to consider. And again, we get into this, uh, this uh, binary data. So a bit, it's a one or a zero. And then binary, binary is base two. So all it is is ones and zeros, ones and zeros, on and off, or true and false. Um, decimal, uh, that's just our normal decimal base 10. So the zero to nine. And then MSB is most significant binary bit. And the most significant binary bit is the furthest to the left. And then the least significant bit would be the furthest to the right. And as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll go over some of this um, binary just to give you a refresher. And the DAC, digital to analog converter. And the ADC, analog to digital converter. And then the span, we all know what span is. And it's the alg algebraic difference between the uh, lower range value and the upper range value. Um, for us, uh, mostly uh, 4 to 20 milliamps with the 16 milliamp span. Uh, we got 1 to 5 volts, which is a 4 volt span, or percent 0 to 100. Resolution. And when we talk about resolution, we talk about the steps it takes to uh, for the span or the range. Um, when we talk about resolution, high resolution equals better accuracy. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. So these are the terms to consider. So 
So analog devices objective one, every change in an analog process is represented by an incremental change in its analog signal. These signals are infinite. So there's so many of these, they're just, they're just infinite. Uh, the change has infinite number of values and is continuously varied. So it goes up and down. It doesn't have to be in an, it doesn't have to be in a waveform or whatever. Uh, it, it can be linear up or down, but it's, it's, it's infinite number of values. So these changes are noticed immediately. So when we talk about something that is analog and we're going analog to analog, it's way quicker. Well, I'm talking milliseconds here. It's quite a bit quicker than uh, if we have to convert it. Because if we have to convert it, we have to go from analog to digital and back to analog. Um, so it takes a little more time to do that. Now, when I'm talking uh, time-wise, we're talking milliseconds. So we would never ever notice it. But in the true, to the true sense, the analogs is faster. So temperature, level pressure, flow, and other processes are all analog inputs, like I was mentioning. So when we're looking at a, a process, all of these things are analog. So any measured change in process results in an instantaneous proportional change in the transmitter output, providing that the transmitter is uh, it's spanned and correctly zeroed and spanned. Digital devices, every change in digital process is not represented. So we're looking at, as, uh, as I'm talking about this, we're looking at uh, a zero and one, zero and one. So we have a one volt. When does the volt or the digital step change to one volt from zero? Does it change at point two? Does it change at point four? Where, when does this happen? So every one of these has a, a, a response to that change and it can be, um, it can be programmed. But every change in digital process is not represented as it changes in steps equal to the resolution of the digital device. So the digital device uses digital singles with a discrete set of numerical numbers. So that's going to be your ones and your zeros. So analog process changes have to be converted to digital and back. And again, if it's a, if it's changes to, uh, converted to digital and then it goes back to analog, it takes time. So it's a little bit slower. The resolution number of steps for spans for the process determines the accuracy. So if I have a high resolution, I have a higher accuracy. Converter applications. Um, with progression of technology, many instruments now are considered smart. So when they're smart, they're changing it to digital. This means they are digital and have a brain. They can still be used as analog devices due to the fact that they are equipped with AC, ADCs and DACs. Now, um, when we look at a, a, a transmitter, um, we address it. If we address a smart transmitter to zero, it becomes an analog transmitter. And you guys probably did that in, I don't know if you did it in third year yet or second year. Anyway, if, I'm got, if I've got a transmitter and I address it to a zero, it becomes an analog um, transmitter. So digital transmitters, digital controllers, digital valve positioners, and that's all we're seeing these days, and DACs, data acquisition cards. So what do we need? Uh, why do we need A to D? Well, a transmitter be, be, may be analog. The positioner may be digital. We need to, something to allow these uh, words, worlds to interact. So if I have an analog transmitter and a digital positioner, I mean, they have to talk to each other. And that's why you need these ADCs and DACs. So analog digital converters, digital analog converters. So here down below, we have um, uh, illustration here of an analog signal coming in from the field. Uh, then it goes over to the ADC, so analog to digital converter. It gets to the digital processing. The digital processing processes the information. And then it takes a digital to analog converter and analog output. So again, this, this takes a lot of time as far as time's considered for these, these pieces of equipment to work. And the analog signal output would be something like pressure to a valve. So there's a field sensor is the first thing that happens. And that's, as we talked about, that's analog. And then it goes all the way to the, the final control element, the FCE. So analog from sensor right there. So I get the analog. And if you look at the bottom of that, I just put in, a, in, a, in a, a little graph down there, analog input, and it shows you that it's just all these squiggly lines, right? 
And that's where this infinite number becomes because it is infinite. It's as many as you want. Digital output. So it goes through the analog to digital converter and I get that digital output. And you can see that the input is digitized on that little bit of graph down below and it's just dots, right? Because it's basically it's ones and zeros. And then of course the digital output goes to a, a it goes through to my DAC, my digital analog controller, and then analog out to final control element right there. And then of course there's my analog output. Now if you look at that output compared to the input, it's quite a bit different and we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about the scan times and things like that because we want that to be as accurate as possible as far as the input and the output. And then of course it goes to the final control element at the end. So again, this is a digital or binary system. It's a refresher and it's not in the ILM, but I just wanted to talk to you about it so that you know when we're talking about zeros and ones, zeros and ones, and ones and zeros. So when the decimal system base is a base 10, the binary system uses base 2. We all know that binary from the second year. The binary digits can be a 1 or a 0. And again, the 1 is true or it's on, and the 0 is false or it's off. And they're all, they're, each one of these is called a bit. A 4-bit number would be represented by a combination of four ones or zeros. So in this case here, there's a four-bit number. An eight-bit number, uh, again, it has uh, eight bits. The value of each is represented by uh, the, the, from the least significant, two to the zero, and it's two to the one, it's two to the two, and two to the three, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's, um, if we, we were to um, look at this digital, we can convert that to uh, um, basically a binary or decimal pretty easily. Two zero is equal to the decimal equivalent of one. So two to the one is equal to two, two to the four is equal to, uh, two to the two is equal to four, and two, two to the three is equal to eight, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It keeps going like that. So use positional weighting, same as digital numbers. When we're talking about the most significant bit, in this case here, I've got 205. And if I'm looking at my uh, binary, it's uh, 2 times 10 to the 2, uh, 0 times 10 to the 1, and 5 times 10 to the 0. So when I look at this as far as binary, and you guys are going to have to convert these. I'm just doing this as a, as a refresher. So the 11001101, the, the, um, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, um, the most significant bits on the first, uh, the farthest left, and the least significant bit is on the farthest of the right. So I've got 1 times 2 to the 7, I got plus 1 times 2 to the 6, plus 0, because it's a 0, times 2 to the 5. And if I just keep going through this, it gives me a uh, 205. And this, maybe this is what you saw in, the, um, uh, in my pre uh, PowerPoint rather than the uh, ILM, because none of this is in the ILM. Uh, I just did this, for, as I say, for refresher. Decimal number, I get, uh, if I look at that too, I get 128, 64, 32, uh, 8, 4, and 1. That's how the binary system works. And if I if I put the arrows down, um, there's a 1 at 1, there's no 2s there, there's a 4, there's an 8, there's a 16, there's a 32, and there's a 128. And all those numbers will add up to 205. 205 divided by 2 is equal to 102 with a remainder of 1. And this is converting this to, uh, um, to a binary. Uh, we'll, we'll just go through this, the binary code. So to the right, it's the least significant bit. And then I repeat that. I keep repeating that. So if you don't remember this, you can go back to this aisle, uh, to this uh, PowerPoint presentation and remember that. I won't, I won't bore you with the details here. But it's all stepped out here. And then, of course, the most significant bit is the, uh, the farthest left. Okay, now we can do in, go into the resolution of a four-bit system and the objective two. So resolution of number of steps in the span or range. So how many steps do I, the more steps I have, the higher the resolution I will have. So in this case here, I've got zero to four volts. 
and you can see all these numbers. So there's uh, the first the first uh, input is zero 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 zero. The second one is one. The third one is two. Then I got three, and it just adds up on the left hand side binary all the way up to to uh, fifteen. So there's actually sixteen steps here. So magic formula: step size is equal to span. So two to the n, and n is a number of bits. So in this case, I've got four bits. So I've got four bits here in the form of the sheet. It's on page seven for this um, uh, this calculation. So you won't have to remember that. It's on it's on the form of the sheet. So to calculate the resolution of one to five volt input to a four bit binary code, calculate the span. The span is equal to four volts. The number of possible codes is is um, two to the fourth, which is equal to 16. And that's because we start with a zero and then we go, we go up all the way to, uh, to 15. So that's 16 steps. When we have a zero, my binary is zero, 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 all the way through for four of them. The formula is span of the input divided by the two to the nth power. In this case, I have two to the fourth power. So this is gonna be the formula for the span. So step size is four volts divided by 15. Now I'm looking at um, 266.7 millivolts per step. So now if I look, if I go back um, and look at that, uh, I wonder if I can go back here. Let me see, I'll go back to this previous one. I'm just gonna show you all these steps that it's taken. So there, there's, a, there's the steps that we were talking about. That's the 15 different steps. Now, when we look at this, we can see that uh, remember, I was telling you that when I when it's it's an on or off, on or off, it's a one and zero, one and zero. So these are truncated. They what, what steps does it takes to get them to the next voltage and say, yeah, this is up, this is a positive, or this is a true, or this is a false. So let's go through that again. So percentage of full scale, one to the n. Describe each step as percent of full scale. We would use decimal formula times 100. So for a 12-bit ADC, would give percent of resolution per step. We look at one divided by two to the 12, because it's 12 bit, times 100, at equals 0.0244% per step. So I'm getting a high resolution. So increasing the number of bits increases the resolution. So in this case, uh, you look at this four bit system, it's got a resolution of 1.67 milliamps. So it's 6.667%. Uh, that's basically the lowest we can get as far as resolution. Um, and, and if we go to eight, we get 62.75 microamps. And as we go to 10, uh, we get 15.64 microamps and as 32. So as, as the, the number of bits increases, the resolution increases. So this is the quantization error. These errors are, are due to not being able to round the binary codes. So what they're saying, if a number is not rounded, it's called it's truncated. So this again, if we round numbers, if anything to our number for on the decimal side, if it goes 0.5, we round up. So if 1.5, we round that up to two. Uh, uh, 2.3, it's rounded down to two. So we can't do that with, um, well, we'd have we have to put that in for the the on off signals so if if it's not rounded it's called truncated so a converter will accept input rises and falls to a certain point before it will change the binary code to a one and a zero this is called quantization error so i have this error if i have a digital signal of 1.5 is it going to go to a two well no because it's not rounded we're going to set that step up as far as the resolution, how, when am I going to change that to an on or off? So that's what we're talking about, this quantization error. So in this case here, if you look at this chart, I got the voltage X is less than 0 0.625. So I'm going to get a zero. It's not going to, because it's truncated, it's not going to a one. If I go from 0.25, uh, my my x is less than or equal to or less than 1.25 I'm going to get a 1 
So you can see there's all these errors really that, that, that are in there and that the error is 0 0.625. Um, before it will change, uh, if you look at the next one, 1 1.25, if it's uh, less than or equal to X and less than 1.875, it's not, it'll change to a two and so on and so on and so on. So these are called truncated numbers. And you can see how that, that will add uh, error to our transmitters and our basically our signal. Okay, an input voltage of 0 0.65 will not change to a zero to a one. So 0 0.625 volt is the quantization error. That is the actual error. So if you look at when it will change, that is going to be called our quantization error or quantization error. So this aliasing is, is a filter system also. So aliasing is, is a sample effect that changes the input frequency another to another input frequency as a result of conversion process. <clears throat> it occurs in the sam uh, sample rate is slower than the process change. So what's happening here, if I have a signal that's coming in from, from my transmitter and I don't scan that fast enough, I may miss some of those analog signals that are coming in. So this is aliasing. What I have to do is I have to have my scan time at least twice uh, this, the, um, the, the sample coming in as far as the, the time it takes. I need, to, I need to have two times the sample rate. So in this case here, to explain this a little bit better, um, I have a analog input signal, and that's the one in red. So you see that analyze, you can see that analog signal going up and down, up and down all over the place, right? Um, if I have the sample frequency of 300 milliseconds, you can see how many of these, uh, I'm, I'm actually missing pulses to the top. Uh, I'm missing a whole bunch of that signal, right? So if you look at that, the uh, sample frequency is the dotted line. So that's how fast I'm scanning and finding out what the information is coming from the, uh, from the uh, transmitter. So it says the sample rate is slower than the process change. If that happens, I'm going to get a lot of error because I want to see all of those uh, analog signals coming in. This gives you a false reading of a true analog signal having this scan at 300 milliseconds because my analog signal is 100 milliseconds. So recommended minimum sample rate is two times the analog frequency. So in this case here, I can see my analog frequency at, uh, what is it, it's 150. So I need, to, I need to do that at 75, at least the minimum. So the sampling twice as fast as the analog signal, that's going to give me the best results of my signal. <clears throat> and in your, in, your form, in your book, it's called the Nyquist Sampling Theorem. And this will definitely be uh, something that you'll have to know as far as understanding it, and it'll be test questions. So, aliasing is controlled with an anti-aliasing filter, a type of low-pass filter. So, if I look at this, um, there uh, on my A, there's my signal coming in, and I've got basically digital, analog to digital. So, the analog input is solid red. And then output is dashed line. So aliasing without the filter is the top one. And now I'm aliasing with the filter. And that's, that's, the, that's basically uh, the, this is the, um, the graph that I'm really looking at this uh, after it's been filtered. So I'm looking at this as being a truer representation of the signal coming in. So where does this aliasing filter, anti-aliasing filter come in? Well, after my analog, I've got my filtered analog. And then I got my, of course, my ADC, analog to digital controller. And you can see that being digitized, digital processing. Uh, then my digital analog converter converts it back to analog signal. And then I've got this reconstruction filter it gives me a, a far better representation of my signal that's coming in from the field with this aliasing filter. Multiplexer, 
Um, so when I'm looking at this multiplexer, this is taking um, inputs from the field. It takes it to the MUX. The MUX has a microcontroller. Uh, it has some memory. And this microcontroller is going to um, take these inputs from the field. Uh, and they're going to be read as far as an importance of the input. And basically, we'll, we will program that to the, the, the fact that some of these inputs are more important to the other ones. So we'll read them first and act on them first. But this was a multiplexer, and this is what it does. So a polling device used to sample signals one at a time from many connected input channels. So in this case here, I have eight channels, zero to seven. It's only showing four, but it shows like zero, one, two, and then, and then up to seven. So it places a hold on the analog signal long enough to convert it to digital val value, which is stored or used elsewhere. But the MUX does all that. And then the MUX, uh, many modern controller devices rely on ADCs, conversions. They each have spe uh, specification as to how we use them. And we will look at some of these right now. So analog input cards, maybe 4 to 20 uh, milliamps now. All of these are in the back of your ILM. Um, just read, scan through them. Um, there's a lot of information on each one of these cards. Uh, so um, you really don't have to be responsible for knowing exactly what uh, the specifications are for each, but I'm just showing you what they are. So analog input or output cards, 4 to 20 milliamps. Uh, you got digital transmitters. Digital. digital positioners. Input current voltage is simply what level of input the card can accept. So if I've got an input card, 4 to 20 input, typically 0 to 21 milliamps or 0 to 10.5 volts. Again, there's variations of these depends who builds these cards. Uh, resolution number of bits of resolution, typically 16 bits. We talked about resolution. Bandwidth. Bandwidth and, and roll-off frequency relate to the highest frequency the card can still read or how fast it can react. Typically, these cards are 0 to 15 hertz and 3 decibels at 2.7 hertz. Again, this information is not important for you, but I'm just showing you that uh, some of these uh, cards that we're using for like PLCs and things like that, um, the scan time at the, at the it's important, and we know that because it's got to be a Nyquist formula, so it's got to be twice the, the scan time as the analog signal that's coming in, and typical speeds is about 25 milliseconds per scan. Uh, thermocouple cards, thermocouple cards puts out a millivoltage, input range is minus 12 to 7.8 millivolts, again a re resolution of 16 bit. So 1.4 microvolts per second or per step. I get a channel bandwidth, all this information, scan times, an RTD card, a uh, resistive temperature device, puts out resistance values. The range of those is 1 to 4,000 ohms. Resolution in this case is ohms per degree. Channel bandwidth is 0 to 15 uh, hertz. Scan time, 25 milliseconds. So again, uh, these are all in the back of your book, and, and don't really worry about the, this because you won't be asked many questions on these things like that. It goes through each one of these, um, each one of these um, specification cards, and that is it for the and there's a blackboard assignment for you for us. So this is the uh, the completion of analog to digital, digital analog cards. And uh, that's, in a nutshell, that's done. Any questions on that? If you do have any questions, uh, again, at, at any time, just email me and I will uh, answer your questions. Sometimes um, uh, you don't have questions until you start to read in the ILM. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, just give me a shout and I will answer your questions emails.